Big Nasty. Yeah, Big Nasty Hall of Fame Tampa Bay Buccaneer fan, baby. And you're watching Tannin Fire Podcast, brother. No other rock and roll. If you ain't watching, you ain't listening, and you're missing out. Woo! The Cannon Fire Podcast is brought to you by our friends at Cool Towel. The Cool Towel is an all-natural, instant cooling towel. No water, no refrigeration, no prep of any kind needed before use. Just take them out of the resealable pouch, shake it up, and it's good to go. It's that simple. When you're finished, put them back in the resealable pouch for use later on. You can find them online at CoolTowel.com, the official sponsor of CFP. We need one, one day, one win, one family, one day, one win, one family, one time. We got one time to do this. That's it. We got one time. Let's go. It's time to go to work. One time on two. One, two, three, four, five. Seconds left, ready to go. The snap, Winston looking, looking, looking. Fade route, far sideline. It is on ball. It's touchdown, Tampa Bay. Touchdown, Chris Godwin. Touchdown, Tampa Bay. Bucks lead. Fire them cannons. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to a brand new episode of the Cannon Fire Podcast here today, August 2nd, 2018, for episode 30. We're going to catch you up on everything you may have missed during the second week of training camp. Lots of good news in store for you today, and we're mixing it up a little bit. 30th episode, we've been around for a little while. We're doing it a little different today, and I think you guys are going to like it. But welcome back to the show here on YouTube, iTunes, and now Google Play Music. I am your host, Rhett, and joined alongside me, as always, today in person, for the first time ever, my co-host, Mr. Bucks Football, Evan. Evan, how are you doing, man? Doing pretty good. It's uh, much easier to do it this way, because then, you know, we don't have to rely on both Wi-Fi signals oh, yeah. and all that, so much better to do it this way, but unfortunately, we can't do it this way all the time, because some of you may or may not know, I do not live in Florida, Rhett does, I don't, so... A lot of times we're doing Skype calls and stuff, so that's why yeah. I might cut out every now and then. So, but it's good to uh, we got the mic here, and uh, it's gonna be gonna be a good one. And uh, we talked about it before. If you guys didn't already know, Evan is down in Tampa for the Buccaneers training camp. He was there yesterday. Today he will be there tomorrow and Saturday, the fourth, the Stick Carrier Takeover Day. So we got a lot of good things coming from our buddy Evan who has media access to a couple of those days. So hoping to hear some good things out of him. But let's get this show underway. We are going to wrap you up on basically all the good things that happened this past week of training camp. It is day seven. We've been in it for a week straight, and we've got a lot of good news to catch you up on. But let's catch you up on something that really popped out the beginning of this week. I believe it was Tuesday. Offensive tackle Caleb Beninot got kicked out of practice, and the reason why is, is fighting. Uh, There was a little bit of a scuffle, supposedly, between Beninok and several other players. I never caught the names of those players. I don't think Cutter ever really addressed it. I don't think anyone ever talked about it. Um, But we do know that it got to the point where guys were swinging. He and a couple of other guys got kicked out of practice. And, and, I mean, that's that's it. You know, Cutter came out on his press conference, said, um, said he likes the energy, he likes the aggression, but... When it comes down to it, you can't swing. That's what's going to get you kicked out of practice, and that is what ultimately will get you kicked out of games. But something else he had mentioned was this is just the time of year where a lot of these guys are under pressure to take that next step or under pressure to fight for that starting job. And at that offensive tackle position, which is where Beninok is normally known for playing, uh, he could be going up you know, in competition with guys like Alex Kappa DeMar Dotson or whoever they really choose to play there because Evan, as we've seen since the beginning of camp, they do like to move some guys around, so it really could be anyone. Yeah, yeah, they do. Uh, Beninok was playing with the first team offense today. He's playing uh, guard. Um, and, I mean, you know, him and Cap have been battling for it. Cap is, you know, Cap actually played tackle at, uh, at uh, well, what's that? what is his college called? 
I, I seriously don't remember. I was about to say Hobart, but that's Ali Marpet. Oh man, that's gonna bother me now. I gotta look that up then. But um, Here, you look that up, and, and yeah, <laughs> and we'll pretty much talk about uh, everything else going on. I'm sure but, somebody but, knows out there they're yelling at the yelling yeah. At the screen. They might be a little bit mad at us if they're listening and they know. But let, let's be honest. If you do know, that's awesome because I really don't remember the name. It was a D two or D three. Humboldt State. Humboldt State. I know they had the green and the gold uniforms. Humboldt State. It is. It just says Humboldt State. It doesn't say whether it's a Division Three, anything like that. Um, yeah, but Humboldt State it was. So. And we had talked about a little bit before regarding the offensive line. You know, obviously a lot of things were changed during the offseason. Coming into camp now, going back to what we were saying about playing different guys in different places, they're moving some people around. As you mentioned, Benadoc was playing guard today. That's a different set of competition that he's got to be put up against. Mm-hmm. So it really, really opens up your mind to all these different combinations that the offensive line could be made. And hopefully they can make some big holes for Rojo or Peyton Barber, whoever they got running the ball come the first half of the season. And got to protect for Ryan Fitzpatrick slash James Winston. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we're going to see how those guys mesh together. A little bit more coming up uh, from them throughout the rest of training camp. So getting excited about the offensive line. Some cool things going on there. Now, moving on, same press conference. Dirk Cutter has actually made a comment about a Buccaneers receiver that a lot of people know, but I think a lot of people forget about. And that's the hump. That's our boy Adam Humphreys. Cutter basically came out, and in the quote, he said, not every guy is going to, run, uh, not every guy is going to catch for 1,000 yards a season, and Adam's not that guy, but Adam is pretty much the guy who is in the right place at the right time and is always exactly where we need him to be, and it's can't say anything more true than that. It's nice to see Adam Humphreys getting some props. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are forgetting about him, you know. Um, a lot of people that look at you know the training camp videos, and you don't see much with Adam Humphreys. He's not, he's not a splash guy. I mean, he's never really been known for, for that big splash play. I mean, he's definitely not going to take a slant 70 yards of the house, but... I mean, he's got a couple of plays that are pretty nice to watch, though. Yeah, he's got some highlights. I, I, I posted uh, yesterday on the page. I posted uh, Adam Humphrey's touchdown from the Falcons game last year. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed this. A little fun fact about Adam Humphrey before I really start to get into it. He has three touchdowns in his career. Each one of those touchdowns, it's one a season. He has three years in his career, one three touchdowns, one per season, and they're all within the last four weeks of the season. Oh, yeah, so he Everyone. shows up at the tail end of every so, year. So it was week 15 last year. Then it was in Dallas. I believe that was week 15. And then it was New Orleans 2015. It was week 14. That? All the, all within the last. That Dallas touchdown, that was like the awkward. That was the crazy one. That was the, that was the that, bumbling that was, that was one, the crazy right? one, yeah. That one was pretty fun. I remember yeah. watching that one as it happened because that Dallas game was yeah. was uh, was. Up and down. Make, it was up and down, but I remember that was a really important game for us that we went out there and lost. But yeah, uh, that's the Bucks. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you yeah, know, back to Humphreys. But, um, I mean, Adam, he's 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 been he's been solid. He always is. I mean, you never really see him. You don't really see him drop a ball. Um, he, he's, a, he's a hard-working guy. Uh, he's not he's not a speedster. He's more of a possession receiver. He's gonna He's not going to get you, you know, He's like he's not gonna take. You're never gonna see Adam Humphreys take a slant and go 40 yards. Yeah, you're just not. He's just, he doesn't have that speed. But to be a guy to be in the right place at the right time, oh, to yeah. get first yeah. downs and, and pretty much, you, you know, to be where you need to be. That's all you can. That's all you can be asked for. So you got to definitely he's good, recognize. I mean, a safe punt returner. I think they want more out of the position. But I mean, he's safe. Yeah, I mean, that's why I think they're trying out Deshaun Jackson and stuff there. Which Deshaun Jackson's also another guy that's being forgotten about. Um, yeah. I guess he just doesn't have the – I mean, last year he had more splash plays, but this year I feel like he's going to have the better year. Yeah. I, I'm ultimately looking to see what happens with uh, Deshaun Jackson at, at punt returns. We've seen some dangerous things out of that man when he played for Washington and Philadelphia. Especially Philly. On the punt return. Yeah, Philly, the, uh, he was the meadow, a fast the me- guy. The Meadowlands miracle or whatever yeah. when he came back. that was all him. <laughs> that was all him. But let's look forward to that. And uh, a lot of praise for Adam Humphreys there as a lot of people do forget about him. Now, moving on to another point, Mike Smith in his press conference has expressed how impressed he is with uh, some of the rookies, MJ Stewart, Carlton Davis, and Jordan Whitehead. Now, MJ Stewart, we've been talking about him since training camp started. This guy has had a hell of a camp. We're a week in, and the way he's performing, 
you can look at his play. You can either play him on the inside or the outside. And basically what I'm trying to say here is that he's a very flexible player mm -hmm. for being a defensive back. And, you know, to be able to make up a lot of ground and cover, that's exactly what we needed. And for being a, a later round pick, you know, it's, it's really cool I mean, to see. You still got to remember, though, he was a second round pick. I mean, even was though, uh, yeah, was, was it, are you talking about Stewart or Whitehead? Okay, Stewart, yeah, I was getting him confused. MJ Stewart is flexible. He can play inside yeah, or outside, yeah, yeah, but I was yeah. thinking of, yeah, of Jordan Whitehead. So I thought, okay. Oh, yeah, Jordan Whitehead was the fourth-round pick. MJ Stewart was second. Gotcha. Uh, talking about Whitehead, he actually had a pick a few days ago. Um, he's got – I mean, he's not going to be a starter right away. Um, but, I mean, yeah, he is a – I mean, he's, he's kind of undersized for safety. But I think – I still think I see potential. I don't see – I don't see him becoming a star player. But I, I think he, he might be able to be a solid starter slash, I mean, solid depth. I mean, and in the fourth round, you're not, I mean, if you find a star, that's great. If you find a starter, that's good. But, I mean, you find depth, in four, and he sticks around for four or five years, it's not a bad pick. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, but, you know, going to MJ Stewart, he's made a splash. And I know you've made a few comments about him oh, in yeah. the last episode. And he's he's been all over the place. Uh, he had a pick yesterday. He is playing tight coverage uh, that Chris Godwin catch yesterday. He was playing coverage on it. It was good coverage. Uh, it was just a better catch by Godwin because that's what Chris Godwin does. It was more of a 50-50 ball, too, Oh, right? yeah, I mean, yeah, it was, a, it was, a, it was an okay throw. But, I, I mean, Godwin just made a, a ridiculous catch. Yeah. I mean, it, it was just insane. So, MJ Stewart's been, uh, been impressed, and I know, I know you, you've had a few thoughts to share about him like we did in the last episode. Yeah, MJ Stewart, he's the type of guy, he's really coming out and – you know, it's it's really cool to see because he is the guy who is supposed to complement, or in this case so far, he has really taken the spotlight off of Vernon Hargraves III. Mm -hmm. We talked about yeah. VH3. I talked about him a couple of weeks ago on the season predictions. I said he is my lock for the break on the defensive side of the ball for this coming season. I still hold true to that, but... MJ Stewart could ruin that for you. MJ Stewart could ruin that for him. I don't think VH3 saw that coming. Maybe but... MJ Stewart's the breakout player. <sighs> wow. Uh, I mean, the thing with that, though, I don't think Vernon Hargraves saw MJ Stewart coming. But let's look at Vernon Hargraves. He's got to take that next step. He has the pressure on him from everything that happened last offseason with the whole video and, and, and things like that, it never got truly resolved. That was this offseason, I believe. This offseason. Yeah. I, I mean, that you this. never hear anything about that either. And yeah. they, you know, I, I'm surprised nothing more came out of that. It came and went. It came yeah, and I went. Mean, I, I think that basically means it wasn't real. I mean, it wasn't him. I don't I don't nah. know. Because, I mean, if, if there's a video of a player smoking a unknown substance that may or may not be legal in the NFL... I mean, they're going to investigate it, if, yeah. you know, but there was, there was nothing that happened. Regardless, nothing may have come on it, but it's still something that shows up next to his name. And it's going to have yeah, people if, question his future in the league because he's been playing long enough. This is his third year. He's been playing long enough where people are expecting a little bit more out of him. And the reason I say that is because, as I had mentioned before, I think there's something about shenanigans that adds that pressure to make them play better. And when I say that, I'm actually referencing today because good news out of Vernon Hargraves III, there was a play you had showed me, a video. It was him one-on-one -on -one coverage with Mike Evans. Mike Evans isn't a small guy. Vernon Hargraves is kind of a small guy. Mike Evans is a big guy. 6'5 <laughs> versus 5'10. And Vernon Hargraves, press coverage all the way. I believe it was a 20-yard dump route towards the end zone. One-on-one -on -one coverage. Mm -hmm. He got physical with Mike Evans. 50-50 ball he made the play. He yep. jumped up, put his hand in there, and didn't let Mike get the ball. And, and Mike Evans is someone who is having also a hell of a training camp. Oh, yeah. We'll talk about that a little bit later. It's been but his Ver best training camp. But Vernon Hargraves got in there, made the play, and it was very encouraging to see because our biggest gripe with VH3 has always been playing the deep ball, getting beat deep, getting beat one-on-one, -on -one, which is something... aggressiveness, which he showed there. Exactly. He put his hands on him. Wasn't anything illegal. It was enough to establish his ground, follow through to the play, something really good that we need to see. Now, VH3 is still a guy who's got a lot of work to do. He's going to need to step it up this season. You know, if he's – if we're talking contention for that starting spot between him and MJ Stewart, we're probably going to have to figure that out a little bit more in the in the preseason. Yeah, it's going to be We've got time coming up. But – 
That's pressure that wasn't there three weeks ago before training camp started. We're going to have to see this guy step up. But if he keeps making plays like that, then it, it, it further uh, – it further proves that he is going to be my breakout defensive player. So and, I'm just I'm going to say it proves that I'm right. And we'll I say mean, that. <laughs> and I mean, how about the the third guy Mike Smith mentioned, Carlton Davis? I mean, we're we're forgetting about him. He's getting he's getting first team reps as well now. Yeah. Because, because Brent Grimes out with injury. See, I mean, injuries are unfortunate. You know, they suck. But Vernon Hargrave's injury led to MJ Stewart getting an opportunity. Brent Grimes' injury led to Carlton Davis getting an opportunity. It. Injuries, they're a part of the game. They're going to happen. You know, I don't care. You're not going to go a season without injuries. Yeah. And that's the thing, too, is that this time last week, doing the best of training camp show, we had touched on Carlton Davis and said, you know, we really haven't seen a whole lot out of him so far. And so far, he's gotten the... He lost the other day. Uh, He he was physical, more physical than Hargraves was. I mean, because he can be. If Hargraves tries to be too physical with Mike Evans, Mike Evans is going to go over top. Carlton Davis, he's a big body. He's 6'1", 6'2". So, I mean, yeah, he's... He's a tall guy for a corner. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the, the tallest corner in the league, I think, is probably 6'3". But, I mean, Mike Evans is 6'5", so he's still taller. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, but, I mean, yeah, Carlton Davis, just the Buccaneers have not really had a corner that plays like this in a long time. Not since... Probably Darrell Rivas, where he can just, he's physical. I mean, Darrell Rivas wasn't the most physical guy, but he's going to try to stick you man to man. Man, now, whether Mike Smith's defense will let Carlton Davis do that will it remains to be seen. I remember with Rivas's year in Tampa, they played a lot of zone with him, and that's not, not, that's not how you play Darrell Rivas. Yeah. How you play Carlton Davis's man. How you play Brent, uh, Brent Grimes' zone. And I would say, as we've seen, how you play a guy like VH3 is going to be that's, man that's coverage. That's completely man. I mean, you know, when they put him in the nickel last year before he got injured, like that Buffalo game and the Carolina game, week eight last year, I mean, he was he was so good. Uh, those are easily the best games of his season. And I think that's something that the Bucks need to see. Obviously, if he ends up being a, a good nickel corner, still a bad draft pick. I mean, you, you draft a, a guy that's only coming in on third down at number 11. I mean, I know you traded down a few spots. Got an extra pick, would you use to trade up for a certain <laughs> kicker? But, um, you know, a nickel corner can still is still valuable. I mean, because third down, it's a passing league now. It, you know, guys are, I mean, 20 years ago, guys weren't passing for 5,000 yards. You know, uh you know, Brad Johnson had literally threw like 20 touchdowns, played most yeah, games, brought, threw 20 touchdowns, and that was a good season. Now, I mean, they'd say, eh, it was kind of underwhelming. So it's a, it's a different league now. And, I mean, Vernon Hargraves, you got to hope he's doing well. But I think the Bucks' future is going to be within Carlton Davis and MJ Stewart. And really, the Bucks' success this season. If the Buccaneers are going to have a top 10 defense, it's because one of the two – are really because that out. secondary is going to be clicking. It because I think the defensive line is going to be good enough to where, like the secondary right now on paper does not look that great. You have, you have Brent Grimes who's aging, Vernon Hargraves he hasn't shown much in game action. You know, Carlton Davis, MJ Stewart, two rookies. Yeah, Ryan Smith who's been awful. Yeah, I mean I, he's I mean you haven't heard much about him at camp either. Um, and then you got Justin Evans, inexperienced. He's good, but he's raw. He's very raw. He's still got a lot of work to do. He's good. He's raw. And and then you got fan favorite Chris Conti. So. <laughs> Other than Chris Conti and Brent Grimes, you're really leaning. Rookies almost. every Yeah, you're really leaning that secondary on a lot of younger guys, and that's yeah. not what a lot of people want to see. But It all know, starts with up front, though. This yeah. defensive line starts producing. You know, that, that bad secondary will turn to an average secondary. That yeah. Maybe NBA Stewart Carls and Davis catch on. Maybe Vernon Hargraves finally figures it out. That secondary comes from an average secondary to a good secondary then. And, and then this team, this defense just takes off. And that's the thing, too. That defensive line can complement that secondary. And these guys are only, as you had quoted, an average secondary. That's all you need them to be. You look at the Eagles last year, I mean... They didn't have the greatest secondary. But that D-line made it, man. The D-line, I mean, Vinny, Vinny Curry and Bo Allen talk about it probably every interview they, they do. They say, you know, we had a rotation. 
And there's enough guys in Tampa for rotation. Oh, yeah. You got Noah Spence behind these guys. William Golston. You got Vita Vea. Mitch Unrein. That's why Jason Light went out and signed Bo Allen, signed Mitch Unrein, Vinny Curry, Jason Beer Paul, kept Noah Spence and Will Golston. And then drafted a defensive tackle with your first round pick. Yeah. It's not like he drafted him with the fifth round pick. Then it's, oh, okay, well, that, this is depth. This is a, you're expecting this guy to be a good player. I mean, and it's the top 15 pick. You're expecting him to be a star. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that's the that's the key. And that'll lead to actually more blitzes for Quan Alexander and Mike Evans. Mike Evans. Wow. <laughs> I don't, why was I thinking about Mike Evans? Let's throw thinking, him up the gut. Was, Let's do it. <laughs> well, hey, I think he can actually be decent. You know, at, like, at a, at a, what, like an fast, outside? Fast, at least. Like an outside, like 3-4 pass rusher. At 6'5"? You know? Six foot, hey, <laughs> Sean Oakman, man. <laughs> um... But anyways, I was thinking Quan Alexander, Mike Linebacker, came in my head, Mike Evans. I got you. Uh, Levante David there. And Scott Reynolds of Pewter Report uh, has said, Mike Smith, everybody was asking, why didn't you blitz? Why didn't you blitz? Mike Smith felt almost like he couldn't blitz because he felt like he had to, he had to help out the secondary more because the defensive line was so bad. He couldn't rely on anybody on that defensive line. Gerald McCoy, sure. Gerald McCoy's getting double teams every time. That's the thing. He had no help. I mean, no no help. You know? And I, I'm sure if, honestly, the last thing I'm going to say on this with light adding, you know, depth, if Robert Ayers wasn't so expensive, he'd probably have kept Robert Ayers, too. That's more depth. I mean, yeah. you know, and that obviously wouldn't bode well for a lot of guys like Will Clark or anything. But I think the uh, thing with Robert Ayers, too, is he was an expensive guy. Still not picked for, up, which is surprising. Yeah, to be honest, he still is putting in work. You see it on his social media. He, he's at the gym working out a couple times a week, doing drills. But the thing with Robert Ayers, with as expensive as he was, we still never saw the player we should have for what we paid. I mean, you so saw a I little guess, bit the first year. A, a little, little bit the bit. first year, but it kind of Nothing. fell off. Yeah, you know it what I mean? It fell off quick. So when we parted ways with him, that didn't break my heart. But talking about that defensive line, let's give you an update on Vita Vea. Now, Dirt Cutter did come out and say that he was in a walking boot the other day, which scared a lot of people. Scared a lot of people, but we have heard that the injury... It's not as bad as we thought it was. I heard initially they thought it was um, some sort of an Achilles injury. The, bu- the Bucks thought it was an ACL. A lot of people, Cutter originally said calf, and then after, that was like when it happened. Then after practice they went and they originally, though they said, though Cutter said in his interview, the way Vita described it, it sounded like it was an ACL. And if it's an ACL or he's an done. Achilles, he's out for the year. Yeah. Well, and that's unless, your first- or something, but in, even then, you're out. Eight, you're out half weeks. the season. Yeah, so, so good news out of there. A still, still kind of. I, I don't know if it's a question mark at this point for week one. You know, it's. I think they're they're gonna be cautious with it. Uh, I think that's what the boots for. I think they was in a walking boot and on the car. I mean, honestly, I looked at that. I got a little worried. Yeah, because you know you think a calf injury. Okay, well, I mean he was able to walk off on his own power. Then the next day you see him in a walking boot. That's yeah. not that's not good yeah. at all. Um, at least he's not I, on crutches or anything. I yeah, mean. <laughs> I, I would I wouldn't expect him to play in Miami next week, but I think he would. I think he's gonna play in Nashville. You think I he'll think, make a preseason appearance? I think he's gonna play in in uh, with the, versus the Titans. I, that's like in like two and a half three weeks. So. Okay, but regardless, good news out of Via Vea in the first round pick there. So not too much to worry about. We should see him ready. For regular season action, no matter what happens here on out. Moving on to the offensive side of the ball, we got a couple more things to talk about here, and then we will discuss what Evan experienced at camp today. Let's talk about the quarterback situation. Jameis Winston versus Ryan Fitzpatrick. I wouldn't say versus. These guys aren't fighting for a starting spot. We know Fitz is starting the first three weeks. Jameis is going to be starting week four. There is no doubt about that. But let's break down what was said by head coach Dirk Cutter. Cutter basically said the good thing about an experienced quarterback, and he was referring to Fitz, is that you don't have to squeeze as much reps out of these guys because he's been here before, he knows what to do, he catches on a little bit easier, and you just don't need as much out of him. Cutter said if you count it up, Jameis is still getting the most reps. First, second, third team, no matter where he's at, he's out there doing the most work at the quarterback position, which, again... All signs point to Jameis starting week four, and I'm hoping he comes back and balls out because 
you know, as I mentioned before, shenanigans kind of push you to be better. Uh, so let's hope Jameis can do that come week four. But Fitz and, uh, Fitz and Jameis come training camp so far, getting work done, man. We've seen good things out of both of them. Yeah, yeah, you have. And uh, today was a bit slower. I'll, I'll get into it a bit more. But, uh, yeah, they both they both showed that uh, they've been good. Jameis, of course, he's had them throws where you're like, whoa, that's, you know, yeah, he, no, like he threaded that thing in there. Yeah. Like you, you can't fit that any better. Then he's got some throws of, you know, wh- wh- why'd you do that, you know? He's still got those. That That's how he is, you know. it's. Uh, I don't um, know if that's something that's going to be able to – I mean, you, I don't you, know can, you can reduce it. You can't you can reduce it, it, but I don't think that's something that's ever going to go no, away. No, you can reduce it, but you, you can't eliminate that. Uh, the that's... scariest part is, is that you think about that, and you think about comparing him to Brett Favre and and what Brett Favre did. Do you know Brett Favre threw 29 interceptions in one year? One year, well, we got a pretty good thunderstorm. Uh, out yeah, there. I don't know if you guys can hear that. I've got the mic on different settings this week, but there is some thunder brewing behind us. Um, yeah, uh, Brett Favre had 29 interceptions one year. Tw- yeah, I think he threw 22 touchdowns, 29 interceptions. What's 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 the most Jameis has thrown in a season? I think in it's 18. Season, I think it's I think it's 18. Might be 18. I'm I think, thinking I think 18. Was, I think it was 2016. I, I think he threw. I think he threw 28 touchdowns that year, and then 18 picks. Is what I want to say. And he might have rushed for like one or two. Maybe. He might have rushed for one or two. I'll, I'm going to double check that just to be sure. Yeah, let's check it out. Why not? But, uh, again, as I was talking about before, the scary thing about that is you think about how it never goes away. Brett Favre, when he almost took the Vikings to the Super Bowl, still throwing an interception. was at the tail end of his career and still threw an interception. And, and I mean, it was... You look at the play, that's the announcer who was calling that game. I remember him getting literally angry. He was like, why would you throw that? Why would you do that? Um, uh, yeah, okay, so right here, it, yeah, you were correct. 2016, he had 28 touchdowns, 18 interceptions. And James Winston rushed for one for one touchdown. Um, so basically 29 total touchdowns, 18 picks. Uh, first year, 22 touchdowns. 15 picks, and then last year, only playing in limited action, 19 touchdowns, 11 picks. And he rushed for but the 22 touchdowns, 15 picks here. He also rushed for six touchdowns that year. That was the year before? That was his rookie was that year. The, the rookie okay, year, so is that was rushed, the year is when he rushed for six touchdowns. The one the one that I remember the most is the one against New York. And he, he I was there. He dove up I and over. There. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, think, I think that's something Cutter told him not to do anymore. Because he doesn't do it. Yeah, I mean, you literally, you see six, and then one, one. I mean, he doesn't do it anymore. Now today, of course, I posted a video on the page. I think I posted it on the page of him. No, actually, I didn't. It was the Chris Conti one. Anyways, I posted all my story. Anyway, yeah. Jameis, we're in a red zone drill, and Jameis pump faked one way. He pump faked one, and then he. I thought he was going to throw it because it's just, everybody was in the end zone. I thought he was going to throw it up in the air. He tucked it? And he, he ended up pumping it and then went and then slid in for the touchdown. So I'll have to show you it later. But uh, How did that slide look? Because I know he's a bigger guy. Slide looked guy. good. Yeah. Slide looked, I mean, he played baseball. So <laughs> I don't remember which. I, I think it was Peyton Manning. He had that slide that one game. Um, I think they were playing San Diego at the time. San Diego, not LA. Uh, yeah, I remember we had that situation last <laughs> and, uh, episode right and uh he was mic'd up for that game and he slid and like bounced out of it and it was just really awkward and uh, i don't know i something about bigger quarterbacks like i big ben i don't think i've ever seen a perfect slide out of a, a guy like big ben but quarterback situation looks good nothing to worry about there Jameis evans still making things happen with uh Jameis winston still making things happen with mike evans and ryan fitzpatrick as we mentioned last week doing some great things with both Mike Evans building chemistry there and Deshaun Jackson. But talking about another offensive weapon for the Buccaneers, a guy who stood out Wednesday on practice and a guy that I'm I'm really excited for because we didn't see all we could have his rookie year. That's tight end Big O.J. Howard. Orange juice. Orange juice. (laughs) He stood out in practice on Wednesday. He had a good bomb touchdown from Ryan Fitzpatrick and, and something else that I had noted you look back, you look at the way he's playing on a lot of plays. He's gotten a lot better with blocking. He's standing guys up. 
And I remember last year at the tail end of the season, Pro Football Focus rated him the lowest rated first round draft pick, the, the lowest rated first round rookie, basically. He was last in the league at his position of tight end. We know he's a talented guy. We saw him get open in space, make some plays, and a couple of touchdowns last year. He's not a bad player, but the reason he was rated so low was the blocking. And to see him stand some guys up at training camp, that's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, I mean, it's something he's got to definitely improve on. Um, I mean, that's something Cam Bray isn't the best at either. Um, but coming out of college, O.J. Howard was known as this, like, two-way guy. He could... He could blocking is what got him um, such high praise in Al at Alabama. We didn't see that as much. And I think it's sort of the situation, you know. It's always uh, whether you're running the ball or throwing the ball. I think when O.J. Howard was in, they were throwing the ball more. You know, I think that when he was in and when, when they were having him block, he might have missed a few blocks. I mean, tight ends, you know, tight ends are hit and miss with blocking. Yeah, you know, I they're fifty-fifty guys. <laughs> so that they're like running back with blocking. So uh, Cameron Brate isn't is probably a worse blocker, but I mean, Cameron brate has been here longer. He knows. I mean, he's picked it up a little bit. So, yeah, um, and I mean, if you're, in, break. if you're in a position where you're a tight end lined up to block, that's not going to be a block that you have to make. No, no, because Most you'll have the time. You'll have help sometimes from the from the tackle, um, because you're obviously you're gonna be right next to the tackle. Yeah. So um, and if he gets by you, maybe there's a running back there that can chip him or something. Uh, but, but regardless, yeah, regardless, some good progress from OJ Howard. Hoping to see some big things out of him. Now, who was your breakout player on offense? Yeah, I believe so. Yep, I believe it was O.J. Howard. Because I went to everybody who's picking uh, Chris Godwin. Chris Godwin. And I just thought that everybody's been forgetting O.J. Howard. I mean, this guy this is a guy who everybody talked about when they drafted him. Everybody said, well, you got Cameron Bright. How are you going to spread that ball? That's a two-tight end set, man. That's, well, it's, it's a two-tight exactly end what set. you brought him in they, to do. They both got six receiving touchdowns last year. O.J. played in two less games than Cameron Bright, and they both got six receiving touchdowns last year. So I think that... You know, a lot of people are forgetting about how explosive he can be, and I think that he's going to be a bigger part of the offense. At first, you know, first few weeks, um, I mean, he got that touchdown against New York, um, but, you know, the first four or five games, he was quiet. You know, he was kind of quiet. He didn't play much at all in that Chicago game. I remember he had one catch. Yeah. Um, but he was quiet. And uh, I just think they're going to get him involved in the receiving game more. He's got incredible speed for a tight end. And he's strong, you know. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, he's a big guy. I mean, I mean, he ran a four-five-one. I mean, that that's that's ridiculous for a tight end. So, I mean, I just think that every the attention is going to be focused on Mike Evans. It's going to be focused on you know Cameron Bray, especially in the red zone. I mean, people pay attention to Cameron Bray a lot, and I think OJ Howard is going to be able to take advantage of that. And I mean, it shouldn't it shouldn't be a surprise pick, you know. I, I shouldn't have to say breakout player because. Because he's been here for I mean, a year. Everybody for, knows who everybody, he is. Everybody knows him. But everybody's on Chris Godwin right now. And no, don't get me wrong. I think Chris Godwin's going to have an awesome season. Yeah. You know? But I think that, I mean, he may even have a better statistical season than O.J. Howard. Because I think he'll get more of an opportunity. Because I think he'll end up being the number two wide receiver. Um, so he'll be on the field more. So you think he'll be number two wide receiver before the end of, end of the year? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think early on, I think you could really see that. And apparently in minicamp, they've been working, um, minicamp and OTAs, they were working Godwin and Evans outside with Jackson inside. Um, and Humphreys would move inside, Jackson would go outside, Godwin would come out, you know, whoever needs a breast, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and then obviously you got the fifth wide receiver competition. We'll, we'll get more on that, you know. That that that'll mainly be determined in, in the preseason games. Yeah. That that's not something you can really. I mean, people can have a good practice, but I mean, preseason games are huge for that. So. And we got some time to figure that out. Football starts tonight. Actually, mm -hmm. the Hall of Fame game. We're gonna be up at Wing House after this. We might catch a little bit of that game. <laughs> um, it starts at eight o'clock, so we'll see how that goes. But let's move over to what you experienced at training camp, man. Run us through your half of uh, of pretty much your bullet points of. Of what happened out there today. We, we've caught you guys up so far. Let's talk about what happened today. Yeah, well, I mean, yesterday, 
Uh, I remember I just talking about Chris Godwin. He was an absolute monster yesterday. Um, I know you said I was there yesterday. I wasn't. Oh, you uh, weren't? No, I wasn't. Uh, I got in yesterday. My, my plane landed early yesterday. I'm in the next three days. But I wish I was because, wow. I mean, he put on a clinic. Uh, especially that that one catch like we were talking about with MJ Stewart right yeah. on him, you know. And uh, there's a few other catches that we didn't get video of. But, uh, I mean, they were I, – I just – the kid, guy just doesn't drop the ball. And, you yeah. know, I was talking to Trevor Sikma today from Pewter Report, and he said, you know, sitting at, ni- sitting at 19, okay, O.J. Howard, he wasn't expecting Godwin. But he said when they picked Justin Evans, he said he thought for sure it would be Chris Godwin. He thought it, that would, that pick was Chris Godwin, and Chris Godwin was still available. And then, well, and then they picked Justin Evans. He was like, "Oh, okay, so I guess Godwin's out of the picture." And wasn't picked, wasn't picked, wasn't picked. Now all of a sudden, the Bucks are on the clock, and Chris Godwin's still there, and they pick him. I mean, I couldn't believe I had a I had a late first round grade on. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, obviously, if you guys don't know, I'm near the Philadelphia area, so I catch a lot of Penn State. That's where he's from. The kid was a beast, you know. Um, caught everything quick enough to get separation. Um, tough kid, it, you know, and he's showing all those things that he showed at college. He showed them. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's tough. He battled. He took, said he battled through injuries last year. Was not any obviously significant because then he wouldn't play. But you, you had those nagging injuries. Everybody does. I don't care. If you're a football player. At the end of the season, you're you're healing. You're, be you're, you're, you're taking two to three weeks to heal your body before you start training again. Because you, you're you hurt. I don't care if you don't have an injury or not. You're sore at least. Yeah. Um, and, he, yeah, tough, gritty, can just can catch anything. Honestly, he sounds like a Patriots wide receiver. Yeah. But um, he's not – I mean, he's bigger. You know, he's not like a Wes Welker type. But, uh, yeah, Chris Godwin's just an animal. Uh, expect him to have a big year this year as well. Awesome. Um, the running back situation now, everybody's talking about Ronald Jones, Jaquiz Rogers, Peyton Barber. Um, Charles Sims, I didn't really see him much today. He was running a lot with the threes. Saw a little bit of Jaquiz Rogers. But a main guy who caught my eye was an uh, undrafted running back from Duke, Sean Wilson. Uh, I mean, this guy, Cutter was repeatedly mentioned uh, in his press conference. He actually mentioned him today. He mentioned him. And I think this kid's going to make the team. Yeah. Uh, I think he. I think Charles Sims going to end up getting cut. And I think uh, Sean Wilson's going to end up taking a spot. He, they've had him doing kick returns, of course, but uh, all kick returns were touchbacks, unfortunately. So he got, didn't able to get to return any of them, but uh, they had him out there to do some kick returns, and they had him out there with the threes and just the burst he has. I mean, this guy's got speed. This guy's got more speed than Sims. He's got more speed than Rodgers. The only person he doesn't have more speed than is Jones. Uh, because Jones is just a burner. Yeah, Bone, um, Jones is quick, man. I actually, I didn't see much of Ronald Jones today. Um, I mean, they were doing the the mock game today. Yeah. So I mean, they they weren't doing like a normal practice. Practice actually ended about forty five minutes early today, um, which kind of surprised me. Like I said, I, I told you earlier, I was looking at my clock. It was like 10, 10 a.m. I was like, well, why Everybody's why is there, why is everybody leaving and why are the, <laughs> why are those guys taking off their pads? But. Um, yeah, I, Sean Wilson has looked good. Cutters repeatedly mentioned him. Now, obviously, this is training camp. Not one game has been played yet. Uh, Kenny Bell looked great in the pre uh, looked great in the training camp. Yeah, came to the preseason and you know flopped. That happens. Could he flop? Sure, but I think that this kid has a skill set, and I think he's like Charles Sims, but I think he's a better ver- better runner than Charles Sims. I mean, I saw him run straight up the gut. Dude, he's fast. He's yeah. very fast. Um, and, and the thing I wanted to kind of piggyback on that, the good news coming out of the running back core is that if you've got more guys back there that can produce, it makes me feel better about what uh, what Coach Cutter said at a conference the other day. And I think you know where I'm going with this. He, he basically set a goal oh, yeah, for every yeah. game. And I think it was 125. And, one, 125 yards on the ground per game is pretty much a goal that they have. I think at the end of the season – that averages out to about 2,000 yards. Because he said he said he looked up. He said... I, um, I know he brought up there Dallas. Was, there was six teams or five teams that had over 2,000 yards rushing. Four of those teams made the playoffs. And the only, Cal- only, only one, one that did was Dallas. Dallas. Yeah. It was the Eagles, the Saints. I forget I forget, I forget. forget the other two. It was definitely the Eagles and the Saints that had over 2,000. Um, and I just forget the other two. But was yeah. it the Rams? Might have been the Rams. Might have been the Rams. 
Um, I can't remember the other two. Might have been the Steelers too. Okay. Um, Sounds reasonable. But uh, <laughs> yeah, if we're not exact, sorry, but uh, we're not uh, you know an, an almanac here. So, um, anyways, the more the more good players you can have on your roster, the better. I think you can agree with that. I agree yeah. with that. I think anyone um, is gonna. He's gonna I mean, I mean, no, but nobody's gonna say, "Oh, this guy, this guy's better than him, but he's been here longer, so let's give the edge to him." Nobody's gonna say that. Um, Will Will Sims, you know, like I said, practice is different than a preseason game. If Sims comes out and let's say they're both performing well, I think they'll give the edge to Sims because I think they know the Sims well. Yeah, of course, he knows what um, to do. He fits right in. Yeah, but I think Sean Wilson. Just a name to watch. Just a name to watch. You'll, you'll be hearing a lot about him. Uh, other thing, Chandler Catanzaro looking good. Um, he got an update from Pewter Report. The first day they like tallied kicking, he was 5 for 5. Trevor Moore was 2 for 5. We talked about that. Yeah, I talked about that last week. And then the last time they did it, he was 5 for 5, and Trevor Moore was also 5 for 5. Now today... Now you mentioned something today. Well, okay, well... Uh, you know, today he was two for two. They didn't kick much today because, like I said, the mock game. It wasn't like a like a practice. Per they were se. they were indoor mostly today. Yeah, right? they were I, indoor I'd, all today. All I'd today. actually I'd actually seen if I can uh, if I can change. Subject, I'd seen that uh, one of Brian Anger's punts hit the roof. Dude, there were like five of them. Yeah, <laughs> dude, I was getting frustrated because I'm trying to get video of guys punt returning and every punt hits the roof. <laughs> <laughs> I think well, I was talking. Was it like a loud noise? Not really. I mean, you no. heard a bang, but um, see, he was uh, kind of joking around. He said, "Man, I should have built it ten foot higher." That, that, that I guess that's my fault. Um, <laughs> but anyways, I was talking to Trevor afterwards. He said, "You know, it was a mock game. He probably told Brian Anger, kick it like you would in a game." Because you don't kick the same in practice. Yeah. He's saying, act like this is a game. So he's like, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> he's putting I'm mean, that I'll thing kick the in, roof in the off air. the place. So, uh, yeah, he hit it, I think, at least three times. At least. So, yeah. But anyways, Chandler Catanzaro, he made all of his kicks during warm-ups. Then he goes and he lines up for this kick. And I, did, I did the first kick. It was from 54 yards. Now to you know, to his defense, but this kick is to where it needs to be. And it, I mean, a lot of people. I think it just came off his foot wrong. I mean, that's what me and Trevor were even talking about because I asked him. I was like, "What was that kick?" And he said, "I actually didn't see it, but people told me it was like 15 yards, like it's short." And it was. It was 15 yards short, but. Uh, the good news is of this situation, the very next one he hit, which was like a minute later, he hit right down the middle from 54. So, yeah. um, and then Trevor Moore made one kick and mi missed one kick. So, um, both kickers have been doing all right. Chandler Katzar has been doing good. Um, so the Bucks are hoping that, you know, the Bucks are hoping that. Let's hope for the third can. year straight that I that's mean, our guy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. So you had. You had Roberto. So 2015, who'd you have? 2015. That was the the Kyle Brinsda. Uh, yeah, Kyle. Brinsda. The Kyle. He was the start. And then Connor Barth came in at the end because they got rid of Brinsda after he missed that like 28 yard field goal. That was against Arizona. That was against Houston. He missed it. Okay. I remember that because they the Bucks lost that game by like six points or something, and yeah, like. He missed like two field goals and an extra points. But uh, I, I, the name Kyle Brinza will always stick with me because I will always associate that with just the start of our kicking woes. I don't, I don't know what happened. It was a start. It was a start. Yeah. Uh, well, the start of the kicking woes actually came a bit earlier. It came in the 2014 offseason when Connor Barth tore his ACL at a charity basketball game. Connor Barth was the Bucks kicker. And he tore his ACL. Connor Barth wasn't a bad Bucks kicker. No, no. I mean, he wasn't the greatest, but he was good. Um, and, yeah, he tore his ACL. They bring in Pat Murray for the 2014 season. I thought Pat Murray did well. Um, Pat Murray got beat out by Connor Barth. He got beat out by Connor Barth in the 2015 offseason. Then they cut Barth and trade for Brinsda. Brinsda comes in. He actually made, like, a 62-yard field goal. 
It was either against the Saints or in the same game against the Texans. He made like a 62 yarder. We we're like, whoa, this guy is. But then it just all went downhill. So <laughs> then you got that. Then Connor Barth came back. Then Roberto Aguayo came in. Then, you know, Nick Folk came in. And then Patrick Murray came back. And now and you got now Chandler Pat Murray's Zorro. gone. And now you got Chandler Catanzaro. And then, you know, they'll bring Trevor Moore back and all that. So, and then eventually they'll bring me in. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know. Uh, but anyways, yeah. The Bucks are hoping that they found their solution at kicker. Uh, other thing I want to talk about, which is, yeah, Hargraves just locking down Evans today. It was that one play. Um, it's a good look, man. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, I didn't see, you know, Evans didn't get as many targets as I thought he would. Uh, Godwin got a few. O.J. Howard got a few. Deshaun Jackson got one, but that was the one that was picked off by Conti. Ryan Fitzpatrick just tried to fit that one in there uh, too close, and it just what didn't work. Um, but anyways, yeah, it's just like we described it. I mean, he was... He was about five yards off of him, not ten yards. Like, you see that cushion he's given, you know? Yeah. Um, and Evans went up, and like I said, that's how you beat Mike Evans. You know, that's – you, you got to play physical against him. And, I mean, he still may, you know, catch the ball just because he's that big. He's that good. Uh, but Hargrave's held his own. He was able to knock it out at the last second. So that was a big play. Uh, I got that on film, and that's why I showed you. Um, so, I mean, yeah, that was a, that was a good one. Uh, and the last note I have here is the red zone struggles. Now, Cutter kind of explained why they were struggling here. He said that it was a situation that they put in where there's four seconds left and you have to score a touchdown to win the game and you're at, like, the 20-yard line. So... What would happen was the defense would send three, Gerald McCoy, Jason Pierre-Paul, and Vinnie Curry, I believe, and then they sent everybody, like, right at the goal line. Like, nobody, like, the linebackers were, were like, at, like, the five. And then the rest of the people were in there. They would just and, draw back and cover. Yeah. You said they only rushed, like, what, three? Three. Three. I, I mean, I didn't see any more than three in that period. Um, and they didn't have the quarterback. The first and second team did not have much success. Second team scored with Winston on that scramble. Um, but then the third team scored with Ryan Griffin, uh, the little out route pass. Um, you know who caught it? Uh, number 89. <laughs> 89 no, is uh, Bubba. Bu, bu. No, it's not Bubba Wilson. No, it's, it's not Russell Shepard. <laughs> 89. Oh, my gosh. Is it? Jake Lampman, maybe? Um, I don't know. Because I remember, I know Bernard Reedy, they changed his number, didn't they? No, but our Reedy's still um eighteen. Yeah, I think. Well, I got I got the numbers right here. So all right, we'll pull Bernard it up. Reedy's eighteen. Jake Lantman's nineteen. So then who's eighty nine? Because I know the number eighty nine. I'm just trying to think. Okay, okay. Um, Irvin Phillips. That's right. Yeah, I, he's I, a rookie. He's a rookie. Um, yeah. So they they were successful, but the first team didn't score a touchdown at all. Chandler Catanzaro had to come out for a field goal. Um, that needs to be corrected. Uh, they, they still can't figure out the red zone to save their lives. Um, that, that's a big reason why this team struggled last year. Other than the defense, if you could say one thing, you could say three things about why the offense struggled. R- no run game, inconsistent, I wouldn't say horrible, but inconsistent offensive line play, and red zone. I don't play calling, yeah, but I'm talking about just player-wise here. Red zone's a killer because you can't score in the end zone. you got to bring out your field goal unit. That's knowing three. us last year, Knowing us last year, not having a super yeah. dependable field goal unit, that's going to hurt you there, too. And, and that's three instead of six. You know, you do that two, three times a game, that adds up. You know, um, And like you said, the, the Bucks sometimes missed that and didn't come away with any points. So I think, yeah, they struggled. Um, but obviously, I mean, it's not as bit concerning now with what Cutter said. I mean, thank God they weren't just going through a normal red zone drill. Thank God yeah. there was a situation, and they had to, you know, like force the issue. But uh, Jameis forced the pass, and arrows picked off by Tandy. Ryan Fitzpatrick tried to force a few passes, just got broken up. Let me tell you something, though, one last note I got here. Uh, during that red zone drill, Vernon Hargraves and Quan Alexander are two of the most energetic guys I've ever seen play football. Like, I mean, this is practice, and they're jumping up and down every time somebody makes a play, high-fiving, um, talking to receivers, saying, you know, get out of my face, stuff like that. And, you know, I love it, but it needs to be proven on the field. Quan Alexander's proved it on the field. How much can Vernon Hargraves talk? 
you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's great to have that confidence. I think to play corner, just like Jalen Ramsey, to play cornerback, you have to have confidence. But how much confidence is too much confidence? You well, know Jalen I mean? Ramsey flat out said the other day I that mean, he's he, the best corner in the league. Yeah, I mean, hey, if you don't think much of yourself, nobody else will. So That's true. That's true. But the confidence is good. Uh, like you said, I think Quan is a guy who has really proven himself. So just to have, especially for the younger guys coming in, just to set the tone and to set the energy at practice for this defense – you can get these guys all clicking on the same cylinders. I think we'll be all right, and we'll be able to make something happen. It'll definitely help. I mean, but for sure. without a doubt, good things coming out of the rest of training camp. We got a couple more days to go. A little bit. We got a little bit longer to go. Well, yeah, they play uh, Miami a week from tonight. They're in Miami, um, and then they come back to Tampa for a little bit, and then they head out to Nashville a few days early for joint practices with the Titans. Then they play the Titans, and then. Uh, and you got your first game of Ray J versus the Lions, third preseason game. It's a game the starters are going to play the most in. So, um, But, yeah, I mean, training camp next few days for me. Keep following along on the page, Bucks Football. Head over to pewterport.com to, uh, you know, the best Bucks coverage, you know, besides my page. I mean, me and him, me and him, me and me and Pewter Report, we got you covered. Um, I mean, Scott Reynolds, Trevor Sikama, Mark Cook, they do a great job there. Um videos, live updates, whatever you guys need. I mean, articles instantly after practice. They they do a great job, and uh, they have their own podcast, the the Pewter Nation podcast, which I'll be appearing on tomorrow, uh, Friday, uh, August 3rd, right after practice. Uh, so, yeah, if you guys catch that, go ahead, and, uh, yeah, just stay tuned. It's going to be uh, gonna be exciting, especially with the Stick Care Takeover on, uh, on Saturday. And actually, Rhett, you may be there. Yeah, man, definitely going to try and make it out to that. But an exciting time of year. Ladies and gentlemen, we are a week away from Buccaneers football. And it doesn't seem real now that I just said it out loud. It still doesn't. But I'm so excited. A week away. And cherish the... it. It goes fast. Yeah, man. It goes fast. Let's make the most out of this season. Let's keep it positive And let's see some work on the field from our Buccaneers. But that's just about going to do it for this episode of the Cannon Fire Podcast, episode 30. Wrapping you up on the second week of training camp. We will talk to you guys next week. But before we go, make sure you follow the show on Instagram at Cannon Fire Podcast. We are on Twitter at Cannon Fire Pod. And make sure you find us on iTunes and now Google Play Music at Cannon Fire Podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening for 30 whole episodes. And it's time for Bucks football. We'll talk to you guys next week. See you later.